All right, we're going to switch over <clears throat> and start talking about trying to stop Hitler, who's running roughshod all over Europe and North Africa. So decisions had to be made as to where we were going to attack. We were going to go on the offensive, but where was it going to be? Uh, we knew that the Russians wanted us to open up the second front in Western Europe, say France, like a D-Day invasion. Um, and, uh, Churchill was adamant that we weren't going to attack there first. We had to figure some things out, like how we fight together with the British, who's in charge. Um, they had to, dare I say, practice for the big event that was going to be the D-Day invasion in France. Um, the other reason that historians talk about that Churchill didn't want to attack at France first is that that would ease the pressure off of Russia. And that's exactly what Stalin wanted. Stalin wanted the, the uh, attack to come in France so that the Germans would have to turn their troops westward and it would open up the door for Stalin to be able to take over territory like the Russians wanted to do. And Churchill was really skeptical of that. Uh, he was afraid that if that happen then you know we'd be dealing with russia which we are anyway later on after the war's over but churchill's philosophy was let the russians fight it out over there and don't make it too easy on them even though they're allies with the british and the americans so kind of controversial when it comes to that um so the decision was made to first go to north africa to try to to root out the Germans out, out of North Africa. The problem is, is they were led by uh, uh, a man who's nicknamed the Desert Fox, who was Erwin Rommel, who's arguably the, one of the best generals ever in world history. Um, and they were, you know, working their way all the way to the Suez Canal so they could get to the rich oil fields. And uh, it wasn't going to be an easy fight. Uh, the Soviets were really upset when they heard that the Allies were going to attack first at North Africa, um, but that's the decision that that they had that they made. I'm going to jump ahead here to a map. Sorry, um, this one right here. So here's North Africa. There were uh, the biggest amphibious landing to date in American history in November of 1942 happened in Morocco. Um, but it was a multi-frontal attack um, with, with uh, landings in a number of different places on their way to defeating the Germans. And at a certain point, um, Hitler had to make a decision. Does he try to continue to protect North Africa or does he want to take his elite African core, they were called in Erwin Rommel, and bring him up to Fortress Europe and protect what he called his Fortress Europe? And that's what he decides to do. He bails out of North Africa um, and after defeats at uh, Kasserin Pass and El Alamein, and he brings his, his troops and Rommel up to Fortress Europe to protect that. So the first uh, invasion that happened um, was in North Africa and resulted in a victory by the Americans and a conference at Casablanca, um, where, you know, one of the, the first times that you're going to get a number of these allied uh, leaders meeting at the at this meeting here you had had uh, Roosevelt there he is there and there's Churchill and you also had the French leaders as well there and they talked about a couple things there like what's next on the docket where are they going to attack and the decision was made to go uh, to Italy and attack it, it the what they called the soft underbelly of Fortress Europe which again upset Russia. Russians are getting very uh, angry at, at the Allies because they refused to open up that second front in France. That's what they were pushing for, a second front, for, front in Western Europe. And uh, an invasion of Italy was not good enough for the Russians, they wanted it to be in France. So there, you don't see in this picture Stalin. He's not invited here because they know he'd be really upset when they told him that they were going after uh, Italy first. So they also decided here on unconditional surrender of, of Hit, Hitler and Hirohito from Japan. So unconditional surrender, meaning they would accept no concessions, that it was, you know, all out to total surrender. 
And, and again, that, that's going to be more loss of lives. And people were concerned about that because of the fact it was going to lead to more deaths. So the Italian campaign begins, um, the invasion of first Sicily. And uh, the forces came, came ashore at Sicily to, at first, like uh, Sicilians were cheering for them because they were so happy to see the allies come, come because they didn't like being controlled by Mussolini. But once they crossed over from Sicily to the toe of the boot to uh, mainland uh, Italy, that's when the fighting started and it was pretty intense. And it took uh, the allies uh, nearly a year to clear all of, of Italy of the Germans and get the Germans to bail out. Um, there, it was, you know, it was a, it was a victory for the Allies because uh, Italy, in the after that war ended, joined the Allied side, and the people were so upset with Mussolini that they uh, put him in front of a firing squad and they um, hung him by his ankles. He and his mistress. It says here after the Allied occupation of southern Italy. The king ordered Mussolini to be arrested in order to sign the armistice. Imprisoned and liberated by the Germans, Mussolini lived in northern Italy until his capture and execution on April 28, 1944, along with his mistress, Claretta Pitacci, by military forces of the Italian resistance. Next day, their corpses and those of Mussolini's henchmen were hanging in the, in the piazza uh, in Milan for public viewing. So they, uh, the Italians were not real happy with uh, the the path that Mussolini had them go down. And in 1945, they executed him. After the Italian campaign, there was another meeting and this time Stalin was invited because now they were going to plan the D-Day invasion. Um, so the, the uh, meeting happened in Iran. Uh, the capital of Iran is Tehran. And uh, that was a British territory at the time. So the big three, they're called, decided to meet there. You have Stalin here, Roosevelt, and Churchill. And again, the, Stalin was um, happy that they were going to go to uh, invade in France. However, he still harbored a lot of resentment because of the Russian loss of lives, uh, because of the delay of the opening of a Western Front. So the D-Day invasion was planned, an immense operation. It says here on the evening of June 5th, 1944, more than 150,000 men a fleet of 5,000 ships and landing craft, 50,000 vehicles, and 11,000 planes sat in southern England, poised to attack secretly across the English Channel along the Normandy coast of France. This force was the largest armada in history and represented years of training, planning, and supplying. Because of the highly intricate Allied deception plans, Hitler and his staff believed the Allies would be attacking at the Pas de Calais. And I'll show you that when I get when we get to the map. Speaking of those... Uh, uh, deception um, attempts that were successful. These tanks are made out of rubber and canvas. And you can see they, they are not real. Here's a plane that's just a, a cut cardboard cutout of a plane. And they put this all around. They, they made hundreds and hundreds of these tanks and airplanes that were fake and put them all around. So it looked like the invasion was gonna happen in another, another place. Um, so when it comes to breaking up the Atlantic wall, this is what they knew they were going to be faced with. You know, they were going to have these Belgian gates. They were going to have these um, iron crosses. And on the tip of each one of these iron crosses were uh, mines that if a boat hit them would blow up. It was terrifying. There were, there were thousands and thousands of mines all over the beaches in Normandy in preparation for the attack. The Germans went and put those thousands of mines out there, hundreds of thousands of mines. Um, they had four years to build up their defenses. Uh, France fell in, in 1940 and Hitler began to plan for the D-Day invasion uh, in 1940 and it came in 1944. So four years of building up their defenses and uh, everybody knew that it was going to be um, a rough attack. There were going to be lives that were going to be lost and there were many lives that, that of course were lost in the D-Day invasion. Here's a, here's a line from a book I read called The Longest Day. Uh, author is Cornelius Ryan. It says, a phalanx of ships bore down on Hitler's Europe. 
the might and fury of the free world unleashed at last. They came rank after relentless rank, 10 lanes wide, 20 miles across, 5,000 ships of every description. There were fast new attack transports, slow rust guard freighters, small ocean liners, channel steamers, hospital ships, weather beaten tankers, coasters, and swarms of fussing tugs. There were endless columns of shallow draft landing ships, great wallowing vessels, some of them almost 350 feet long. Some of these and other heavier transports carry smaller landing craft for actual beach assaults, more than 1,500 of them. Ahead of the convoys were a procession of minesweepers, coast guard cutters, buoy layers, and motor launches. Barrage balloons flew above the ships, squadrons of fighter planes weaved below the clouds, and the surrounding this fantastic cavalcade of ships packed with men, guns, tanks, motor vehicles, and supplies, and excluding small naval vessels was a formidable array of 702 warships. So that's pretty impressive uh, attack, no doubt. The first thing that happened though was the 101st Airborne, along with another a, 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 num a number of other groups that were American and British were dropped behind enemy lines the very, uh, in the middle of the night before the attack. The attack was gonna happen you know, early, early morning on June 6th, 1944. And uh, in the earlier morning and in the night on the, of the 5th, these, the 101st Airborne along with others were dropped behind enemy lines and their job was just to tear everything up, cut off supply lines, blow up bridges, um, blow up telephone pole wires, just wreak havoc. So it was hard for the British, or excuse me, hard for the Germans to be able to transport their troops and tanks to the beaches and also uh, to prevent them from being able to uh, communicate with each other. So this, this bridge right here uh, was one of the targets. Actually, this bridge right here, it's called, they codenamed Pegasus Bridge, and they blew it up. You could see these X's in here. Those are actual gliders that, that flew in. Um, and, 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 you know, they're, they're gliders. They don't have an engine, so they're really quiet and... Um, the Germans couldn't hear when they landed. Now, many of them, they all crash landed. There's no engine, so you're just hoping that you land safely. Hundreds of men died the day before D-Day uh, because of plane crashes. Uh, but they did successfully blow up Pegasus Bridge um, and, and the, did prevent tanks from being able, many prevent, temporarily prevented tanks from being able to get to the beaches after the uh, D-Day invasion. That is a a glider right there. They're basically made out of um, plywood. So uh, scary landing in one of those. And there's an example of what would happen, a down glider right there and the dead servicemen there. Some D-Day statistics for you. 156 Allied troops landed on D-Day that very day. 156,000 landed. That's a lot of troops. 11,590 air, Allied aircraft were used in the attack. 127 of the aircraft were lost. 867 gliders from the Royal Air Force, the British, and the United States Air Force. Over 5,000 ships and landing craft were used. 326,000 plus troops, uh, 54,000 plus vehicles, 104,000 pounds of supplies have been landed on D-Day plus five. So D-Day plus five means five days in. They that landed that many troops. Uh, on that day, approximately 10,000 Allied troops were killed, right? That's an estimate. They don't know for sure. So you can see here, this, this map shows you phase one, midnight to 2 a.m. was when the 101st Airborne was dropped and the gliders and whatnot. Um, the deceit, the, uh, to distract the enemies, the Allies faked another invasion taking place at, at the Pa de Calais. Um, so yeah, they, they, the Pod de Clay was the, is the closest distance between England and France. It's actually right here. If you could see my cursor, there's, there's where they, they faked that the, uh, attack was going to happen. That's where they had all the fake tanks and fake airplanes. And it made it look like they were massing to go and attack across from Dover to the, the, uh, Pod de Clay right here. They were going to come across from England to France and attack there. And then you could see the code name beaches, uh, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword Beach. The naval attack began at 5 a.m. At 3 a.m., there was a naval, there was a uh, aerial attack. 
dropping bombs, trying to soften up the uh, Germans all along the coast here before the actual attack. They weren't very successful in softening them up though. They missed most of them, of their targets. <clears throat> so you see Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword. If you've seen uh, Saving Private Ryan, uh, the atta that attack happened at Omaha Beach, very intense, uh, high casualty rate at Omaha Beach. So here's just that map that I showed you earlier. Here, the originally before, this is before the D-Day attack. The D-Day attack is happening here, but a year before, um, the attack happened at Sicily. Remember that was, and then they took a year to clear Italy and they finally did in 19, June 4th, 1944. It was two days later when the D-Day invasion happened. Here's, if you're wondering where the Pas de Clay is, it's right there. That's the fake. The actual invasion happened down here. So the Germans had sent a lot of their troops up here in preparation for attack at the Pas de Calais because of recon photos of the fake um, tanks and airplanes over here uh, in London or uh, near London, above London, this area. Now the, the goal here is with the D-Day invasion is to push the Germans back into Germany like in World War I. And that after D-Day invasion was, was the beginning of that. So remember, the first attack happened in November of 1942 in North Africa, the second one, July of 43 in Sicily, and then the third and biggest one, June 6, 1944, invasion of France, because the Germans had been in France since 1940. So they had to get them out of France and push them back. It says here a couple of just uh, interesting things here. The invasion was originally scheduled for June 5th, but a storm on June 4th forced General Dwight D. Eisenhower to postpone it one day. Um, so June 6th was the time. Um, it says, uh, if the storm continued on June 6th, the Allies would have waited another two weeks until the next low tide and first light would coincide. They really wanted to attack at low tide so they could run up the beaches. Though th these... Uh, Boats right here were, were called Higgins boats, and they were invented by a guy by the name of Higgins, who was from Louisiana and built a fleet of landing craft uh, on Lake Pontchartrain there. And the Americans, he became very rich because the Americans went and bought all of his landing craft. It was specifically for the D-Day invasion, these landing craft. Um, they saved a lot of lives. Terrifying, right, when they'd open up this gate at Omaha Beach and they'd get the intense fire and Again, if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, a lot of people say that's very accurate to what happened at Omaha Beach. Robert uh, Capra was a photographer, an embedded photographer, so he took pictures. At first, he was very disappointed because his pictures took on this blurry tone like this picture right here. But after the serviceman who survived said that's exactly how it felt. It was blurry. Everything was a blur because it was so intense. So they became well-known photos. Here's where Omaha Beach is right here. And this is what they were faced with. That was why it was so dangerous is because they <clears throat> didn't anticipate the cliffs being that steep. And uh, there were, they had Germans that were crossfire, you know, firing at them from both angles. And that's why the casualty numbers were so high. Here's a quote from uh, um, Private Carl Wiest of the Army Rangers regarding D-Day. This is from the book D-Day. The Allied High Command had been right to insist there be practically no experienced troops in the initial waves that hit the beach because an experienced infantryman is a terrified infantryman. And they wanted guys like me who were more amazed and they were frozen with fear because the longer you fight a war, the more you figure your number's coming up. Pretty interesting uh, comment there. There's a guy on the uh, uh, Higgins boat there, a little bit more relaxed. This is later in the day. By the end of the day, uh, the, the allies had control of the beaches and uh, it was a little bit less intense. There they are unloading everything. Speaking of unloading, take a look at that. You could see everything that came off of those ships. There is a, a cemetery at uh, in Normandy. It says here, the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial in France is located on the site of American St. Laurent Cemetery, established by the United States First Army on June 8th, 1944, and the first American cemetery on European soil in World War II. It contains the graves of 9,378 
of our military dead, most whom lost their lives on D-Day. There's another angle. You can see the beaches below where the fighting occurred. The British were really high tech when it came to tanks. They used a number of different tanks, um, like these minesweepers with chains on the end would go and blow up any uh, mines on the beaches to clear it for the servicemen that could come ashore. They were used um, to protect them. And here's another type of minesweeper. Here's a bridger uh, that when they, you know, they, they were gonna blow, they knew they were gonna blow up bridges, but they also then turn around and had to get all, bring all their supplies and go over those bridges, but they're gone now. So the British invented a tank that had a bridge on the end of it that could, you know, help them get their uh, things across all their supplies. These are flamethrowers because in France, there are these thick hedges that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it was a perfect spot for the Germans to uh, German snipers to hide. So they would go around in tanks and they would blow fire all over the hedges and burn them. And uh, you know, obviously anybody, any uh, snipers that were in there would be burned also. In the middle of the war, it was election time. 1944, you know, is an election year. Thomas Dewey was going against FDR. And, uh, you know, it was much easier for FDR to run in 44. It was less controversial because he had already broken the two-term tradition. So what's the difference if he goes three or four? And Americans, again, didn't want to change horses in the middle of the stream. That was a Lincoln quote from uh, 1864 when the Civil War was going on. So uh, he runs and wins. Again, uh, fourth term, he would have been president for 16 years had he not died in his, uh, shortly after. The last days of Hitler, as the walls begin to close in on him, and again, I'll get in a little bit more detail in this in class, but uh, you know, he literally, uh, uh, Hitler could hear the guns from the uh, Russians that are coming from the east that are pushing their way. Um, toward him and he could hear the American and British guns that are coming from the West and the walls were, were closing in on, on Hitler. You could see one last attempt by uh, the Germans to push back as they were getting pushed back into Germany it was the Battle of the Bulge, which they found success in the beginning, but eventually um, the Americans and British were able to, to push back. Words from, from Patton, I'll, uh, I'll talk about some of these, some of the things from our work rated words, remind me in class to uh, go over that. And on April 30th, 1945, 1945 Hitler committed suicide in a bunker. Um, he, his newly, uh, his new wife, he, he had just gotten married hours before to Ava Braun. Uh, they, Ava Braun took a cyanide poisoning a, a pill Hitler took it too and then apparently shot himself in the head before the poisoning took hold and uh, he instructed his men that were there to burn the bunker so they couldn't desecrate his body um, but you know so the, the Americans supposedly came along remind me to uh, read about killing Patton this quote about attempts at, at taking at killing uh, Hitler by his own men and there's the uh, bunker there, this P47 uh, Thunderbolt, the United States Army flies over the crumbled ruins of what was once Hitler's retreat. Um, and they found it, it uh, you know, in, in, uh, in it, was, it was on fire and they were, think they were able to recover the body. It's at an unknown site now. On April 12th, 1945, FDR died of a brain hemorrhage. He was in Warm Springs. He was sitting for a portrait. Someone was painting his picture and he just hit the ground immediately. He, he died instantly when that uh, brain hemorrhage um, blew up. He was with his mistress, not his wife. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was not really happy about that, but uh, we could talk about that later too. But uh, yeah, he, he, he passed away and the nation mourned. They mourned the death of, of FDR. Um, because he was such a beloved figure and he helped Americans through the Great Depression and World War II. May 7th, 1945 is known as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Um, May, yeah, the, the, there were parades the next day. 
Uh, the, the Nazis had surrendered, uh, but in reality, the war was really only half over. There was massive celebration, but it's not as much celebration as going to happen when uh, Japan surrenders. The new president now is Truman, and he says, hey, it, the war is only half over. We still have more to go. So Japan wasn't going to go easy, that's for sure. Um, now, they had been defeated, as we talked about earlier, in the Battle of the Gulf of Leyte, and uh, most of their navy was non-existent after that. But they still continue to fight on the uh, islands, try to protect their interests. They, they um, absolutely were afraid of Americans and didn't want to be captured by them. Uh, so, but, but there were the Americans and led by Admiral Doolittle were, uh, and his Doolittle's Raiders, they were called, were firebombing Tokyo to try to get them to surrender. 83,000 people died in the, the bombing by the air of Tokyo. There were no ground troops. They tried to do it all uh, in the air and they were wreaking havoc on Tokyo, which is so heavily populated. On October 20th, 1944, General MacArthur did return to the Philippines like he said he would after the Battle of Gulf of, Le Gulf of Leyte, he arrived. On March 1945, Iwo Jima was captured. A 25-day assault, over 4,000 Americans died. In o Okinawa was won after fighting from April to June of 1945. 50,000 American lives were lost. And of course, this is after the celebration from VE Day. That's 50,000 lives between April and June were lost on the uh, Battle of Okinawa. Intense. The Battle of Iwo Jima, one of the most well-known, interesting you know, occurrences was the uh, flag raising. This is Easy Company taking the flag up Mount Suribachi after they figured that they had won the battle. Um, they had been fighting four days. They had a 40% casualty rate. And here's the raising, the, the iconic photo that was taken of the raising of the flag on Mount Suribachi on I Iwo Jima. It says here, the raising the flag on Iwo Jima is an iconic photo taken on February 23rd, 1945 by Joe Rosenthal. It depicts five United States Marines and a U.S. Navy corpsman raising the flag of the United States atop Mount Suribachi during the Battle of Iwo Jima in World War II. The photograph was instantly popular, being reprinted in hundreds of publications. Later, it became the only photograph to win the Pulitzer Prize for photography in the same year of its pub as its publication and ultimately came to be regarded as one of the most significant and recognizable images in history and possibly the most reproduced photograph of all time. There's a catch here, is that this was a staged photo. This was the second flag that was raised on Mount Suribachi. The first flag that was raised on Mount Suribachi right there was raised by other, another group of men. Um, and someone down below wanted the flag for a souvenir. And they told the group of men, hey, go up there, get that flag and put this one up. Well, that's when Joe Rosenthal captured that photo is when they, after they had taken down the first flag and then raised the second flag. So the original group got no credit for raising that flag. It was this group that got the credit for doing that. So it was pretty controversial. There's a memorial in Washington, D.C., uh, the Iwo Jima Memorial. Here's, here's the six men right here. Um, three of these men in this photo didn't survive the battle. They got killed later on in that same battle. So the three survivors, John Bradley, Rene Ga Ga Gagnon, and Ira Hayes became suddenly famous and were pu pulled out of the war and were put on the speaking uh, trail and they went and urged people to invest in war bonds they were heroes but in reality they weren't the originals who raised the flag so it was a controversial uh the flat the flags from the first and second flag raisings are conserved in the national museum of marine corps the second flag pictured here was damaged by the high winds on the peak so that's the, the flag that you see in joe rosenthal's photo and there is mount suribachi the flag was was about right here in this area So here's a picture of Douglas R. MacArthur's return. Douglas MacArthur loved to be on the front page in the newspaper. And this photo was staged right here as he walked off the ship and, and all that. And there is a memorial there today for his return. 
All right, <clears throat> let's talk about the Potsdam Conference. Let's talk first about, before we talk about the Potsdam Conferences, let's talk about the Manhattan Project. Uh, top, secret, top secret at the time was the fact that the Americans were pour, pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars into the Manhattan Project to build a weapon of mass destruction. And uh, it was, it was uh, uh, Einstein who wrote a letter to Roosevelt saying, I think we have the potential to be able to produce a weapon of mass destruction that could destroy cities. So Americans invested in it, they started working on it, and they finally figured it out, the atomic bomb. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But uh, the Potsdam Conference was a conference. Now you see Roosevelt is no longer alive. So it's Truman that's there. And here's Stalin right there. Um, they go and they meet there. And the, it, the reason is to talk about the atomic bomb one of the guys who was most surprised that the Americans had an atomic bomb right there, Stalin, he was kept out of the loop. Churchill knew about it. The French knew, everybody knew about it except for Stalin. The Americans are, are beginning to be really concerned about the Russians because of how aggressive they are spreading their communistic idealisms. So they came here, they met, they agreed that we're gonna warn Japan, surrender now or face utter destruction. So they sent the Potsdam Declaration, basically saying what I just said, is that uh, you, you surrender now or you're gonna face a massive destruction. And the, obviously they did not surrender. Uh, let's talk about that atomic bomb and how, um, just get into it. We can get into it more in class, but the first tested atomic bomb was Alamogordo, New Mexico. The first successful test, not in a lab, outside Alamogordo, New Mexico. It was July 16th, 1945. And, uh, and it was successful. They dropped it. It worked. They didn't know if it was going to work. They didn't know if it was going to fizzle out, but it worked. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, after the Potsdam Declaration and no response from Japan, <clears throat> the Americans dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The, the airplane was called the Enola Gay. It, it uh, dropped off the the atomic bomb and it hit Hiroshima, uh, killing 180,000 people. And, uh, and then they said, we have another one, surrender now or, or face the second one. The Japanese did not surrender. And on August 9th, three days later, they uh, bombed Nagasaki, killing 80,000. Uh, on August 8th, in between the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Soviets declared war on Japan. Yeah, they had promised Earlier, we'll be talking in the next chapter about the um, conference, the Yalta conference, where they promised to um, declare war. But at this point, the war is basically over. There's Einstein's letter um, that he, where he uh, told Roosevelt, look, I, I really think we have the potential to be able to create a, a, a weapon of mass destruction. And if you want to read that, you could hit pause and read it. There's the Alamogordo test right there. The mushroom cloud. Before they dropped the atomic bomb on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Americans dropped leaflets down the day before that said, get out, leave, trying to get as many people to leave the area as possible, and saying that we're going to drop a bomb and get out. Some people left, a lot, most people did not. There's the Enola Gay, the airplane that dropped the atomic bomb, and there's the crew that dropped the atomic bomb. The nose of the Enola Gay um, from this area up is at the uh, Smithsonian Museum of Air and Space. There's the core of the Fat Man, the drop bomb that was dropped uh, over Japan. And yeah, this guy holds the fate of almost 200,000 lives. Hiroshima, why Hiroshima? It had a population of 380,000. Uh, it dropped to 255 after evacuations, and it was a military site, and that's why they picked it. Here's Hiroshima before. There's just a model in Hiroshima today, um, here before the atomic bomb, and there it is after the atomic bomb. Right There it is before. Then you flip the switch, and that's what it looked like after. So you, weird that they had some random uh, buildings that were still standing. And there's one of them. That's an, a, an actual picture. This is the right here. This is what you're looking at in the real picture right there. 
Nagasaki uh, was the reason they picked Nagasaki is because it had factories that were producing weapons and, and uh, tanks and things like that. Just looking at it, uh, a map here, if a, a, a nuclear weapon, we have so much bigger nuclear weapons now, but if, if a nuclear weapon was dropped uh, on Palma, right? This is what the nuke, this is a nuke map. So if you dropped it here, everybody from all the way out to Bronda in those areas, Highway 68, um, all the way out to Laurel, all these people would, would be dead instantly from the atomic bomb. And then the people outside of this area, most of them would die later on um, from radiation poisoning. This is a, you know, a list of countries that possess nuclear weapons and how many they have. The Russians, 8,500, the Americans, 7,000. This is old, this is from 2004. I'll try to get this updated. You know, the Russians, how much of the reason that we dropped the atomic bomb had to do with the threat of the Russians, that we wanted to show them that we had a weapon of mass destruction, so don't mess with the United States. Was that a, a possible um, reason why we dropped it? Could be. Um, was it really to save lives? Was Japan ready to surrender, or were they not? Some would say they're not. I mean, why didn't they? They didn't even surrender after Hiroshima. What makes you think that they would have surrendered if we didn't drop the bomb? So all those questions are oftentimes asked and, and uh, debated. And we'll talk about this more in class. VJ Day, Victory in Japan Day, September 2nd, 1945. This was big. The surrender happened uh, on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. And there's a picture of the surrender, the signing after World War II. This meant that the war was officially over now. Massive celebration again. Uh, some iconic photos here of the sailor kissing the um, nurse. Times Square, and there's a, a, a big, this is in uh, Sarasota, Florida, and there's people that, the Me Too movement, they didn't like that, and they spray painted it because they think that that's not appropriate. Soldiers released from Japan, I remember reading the book over the summer, Unbroken, and you, these are some of the, what some of these men look like after they were prisoners of war, and they're barely fed by the Japanese. Casualties. The USSR, over 25 million casualties. All right, the United States, 300,000 casualties. You could see the very small amount of uh, civilian deaths, the purple of civilian deaths, um, and that would have happened at, at Pearl Harbor. A lot of the Russians, look at how many you know, deaths they had, civilian, horrific. And there's a World War II memorial in Washington, D.C. And that's the end of the chapter.